Welcome. Welcome to my workshop. I'm Jim. Today, I'm going to take a look at spark gaps. Among other things, I'm going to create a simulation model of a spark gap in LT Spice. Here's a spark gap in operation. Despite appearances, this is not a continuous arc. It's a series of discrete sparks, but they occur so quickly in succession that our eyes and ears merge the independent events into what seems to be a continuous stream. This is a close-up view of the apparatus. Power is supplied at 6,000 volts DC. The circuit is a simple RC circuit, which is to say it's simply a resistance in series with a capacitance. These two blue resistors are wired in series. They're 1 megohm resistors, so the total resistance is 2 megohms. These four capacitors are wired in parallel. Each one is 2200 picofarad, so the parallel combination has a total capacitance of 8800 picofarads. The capacitors are rated to 6300 volts, so they're just able to withstand the supply voltage when they're fully charged. I've drawn a white ellipse around the spark gap. The gap is created from two pieces of heavy copper wire with their free ends filed into sharp points. The spark gap is wired in parallel with the capacitors. The copper wire on the right hand side of the gap leads back to the high side of the capacitor bank, which will charge up to 6000 volts. The copper wire on the left hand side of the gap leads back to the low side of the capacitor bank. The wooden dowel holds a small dipole antenna. This antenna has nothing to do with the spark gap itself, but I'll use it to measure the timing of the sparks. The antenna consists of two lengths of magnet wire taped onto a dowel. I wrapped five turns of wire around the dowel near the middle and stretched the rest out to the ends. The leads of an oscilloscope are clipped to the center leads of the antenna. If you're only interested in the LT Spice simulation model, then skip ahead to 26 minutes and 5 seconds into the video. In the meantime, I'm going to describe how the spark gap works. This is the circuit without the spark gap. There's not much to it. The 2 megohm resistance is in series with the 8,800 picofarad capacitance. When the 6,000 volt power supply is turned on, the capacitors will charge up to 6,000 volts. And that's it. After that, no more current will flow. The rate at which the capacitors charge up can be determined from the time constant. For an RC circuit like this, the time constant is the resistance multiplied by the capacitance. The resistance is 2 megohms, and the capacitance is 0 0.0088 microfarads. The product is 0 0.176 seconds, or 17.6 milliseconds. The rule of thumb is that it will take five time constants for the capacitors to charge up. In this case, five time constants is 88 milliseconds. Consider the voltage drop over the capacitors, as shown by the red arrow. This is a plot of the voltage drop, showing how it increases with time after the power supply is turned on. When we count out a time period equal to five time constants, we arrive at the moment when the capacitors have charged up to 99% of 6,000 volts. From a practical point of view, we can say that the capacitors are fully charged after five time constants, or 88 milliseconds, and that nothing happens after that. In the apparatus, though, there's a spark gap wired in parallel with the capacitor bank. The voltage across the gap will be the same as the voltage drop over the capacitors. If the voltage drop over the gap gets high enough to ionize the air, there will be a spark. All of a sudden, and with some light and sound, the energy which had been stored in the magnetic field inside the capacitors will be released. In a sudden rush of current, the capacitors will discharge through the spark gap. As electrons and ions accelerate across the gap, they will give off waves of electromagnetic radiation. The radiation will come in all frequencies, including radio waves, microwaves, visible light, and so on. Any pieces of metal nearby will pick up the radiation and can be used as an antenna. If the antenna is connected to an oscilloscope, 
the traces on the display will show a signal. Of course, the spark gap will completely change the waveform of the voltage drop. The capacitors will not charge all the way up to 6,000 volts as they did before. However, as long as there's no spark, the capacitors will charge up at the same rate as before. When the spark occurs, the sudden discharge current will reduce the capacitor's voltage back down to near zero. The spark cannot be sustained at low voltage. It will be extinguished. The capacitors will now start to charge back up with the same time constant as before because they're charging through the same 2 megohm resistance. Once the voltage drop gets back up to the breakdown level, a second spark will occur and the capacitors will discharge again. This cycle of charging and discharging will continue as long as the power supply is on. Two quantities that are often of interest are the breakdown voltage and the repetition rate of the sparks. These two quantities are related to each other. Our spark gap lies between the ends of two sharpened copper wires and a voltage is applied across the gap. A dielectric is the fancy name for whatever material is between the two ends. In our case, the dielectric is air. Let's assume for a moment that the gap is not defined by two sharp wires, but by two perfectly round and smooth copper balls. When the spark forms, it will begin where the air gap is the shortest. I want to look in more detail at this region. This is a magnified view of the gap. Only a small fraction of the surface of the copper balls can be seen here. The voltage difference between the balls, which are called electrodes, will cause some of the free electrons in the copper metal to gather near the surface of the negative electrode and for the electrons in the positive electrode to gather some distance away from the surface. And here's an atom of air. Actually, there's no such thing. Air is a mixture of several different gases, nitrogen, oxygen, argon, carbon dioxide, and a few others in lesser quantities. With the exception of argon, which floats around in single atoms, the other gases come in molecules consisting of two or three atoms. Real air always has some humidity as well, which means that there are also some water molecules floating around in the gap. But it helps get started by thinking about just one atom. It's made up of some electrons buzzing around a positively charged nucleus. The voltage difference between the electrodes means there will be an electric field in the space in the gap. I've shown the electric field as a red arrow. As a whole, the atom is electrically neutral. It has the same number of positively charged protons in its nucleus as it has negatively charged electrons. Therefore, there will be no net electric force on the atom, which would tend to pull it towards one electrode or the other. Even so, the electric field does have a different effect on the electrons than on the protons. The electrons will spend a little more time on the right-hand side of the nucleus, where they can be closer to the positively charged electrode. As the voltage between the electrodes is increased, the strength of the electric field increases as well. The electrons will want to spend even more time on the right-hand side of the nucleus. Further increases in the voltage difference in the electric field increase the forces tending to pull the atom apart. And indeed, if the electric field gets strong enough, the atom will be literally pulled apart. The most loosely bound electron will break free. What's left of the atom now has one more proton than electrons, so it has a net positive charge. In this state, it's called an ion. And this process of pulling the atom apart is called ionization. In this case, the atom is the dielectric, and we say that the dielectric has broken down. The voltage drop between the electrodes at the moment when the atom is pulled apart is called the breakdown voltage. Things change dramatically as soon as an atom has been ionized. The electric field now exerts net forces on the ion and the free electron. I've shown these forces in green. The electric force on a charged particle is proportional to the amount of charge it has. The charge on the electron and the charge on the ion have the same magnitude, but opposite signs. Immediately after the breakdown, the forces on the ion and the electron will be the same, but they will act in opposite directions. 
the ion will be attracted towards the negatively charged electrode, and the free electron will be attracted to the positively charged electrode. Under the influences of the forces, the ion and the electron will accelerate away from each other. Since the electron is smaller and lighter than the ion, it will accelerate a lot faster than the ion. It's possible that the electron will reach the positively charged electrode, but there are other possibilities. If the atom had been ionized over here, then the speeding electron might very well hit another atom, which is on the verge of breaking apart. That would almost certainly be enough of a jolt to ionize the second atom. There would now be four charged particles, two ions and two electrons. The electron which hit the second atom and caused it to ionize will be knocked off course by the collision and may well be heading in a completely new direction now. This has all the makings of a fission reaction. Each new collision creates two more charged particles which start to move. And it's not just the moving electrons which cause collisions. The ions are also moving, and they too can bump an atom into ionization. And that's not all. Electrons which are moving, even at a constant speed, create magnetic fields. A magnetic field can easily disrupt the orbits of electrons in a neutral atom and tip it over into ionization. The moving ions also set up magnetic fields of their own. Furthermore, the electrons on ions will not be speeding along at constant speeds. They're subject to the electric forces of the prevailing electric field and to the magnetic fields of other moving electrons. The electrons on ions will therefore accelerate not only in the direction they're moving, but to the side as well. Charged particles which are accelerating will also emit radiation. Since the ions on electrons will be accelerating wildly, in different directions and at different rates, there will be radiation at all frequencies. Some will be visible light, which we can see. Some will be ultraviolet, which can sunburn the back of your eyes. Some will be radio waves, and so on. In very short order, the region inside the gap will become a confused mix of charged ions and electrons, flying this way and that, constantly colliding. There will be a confused web of magnetic fields which will further influence the trajectories of the charged particles. That feeds back into different patterns of electric and magnetic fields. This whole messy region is called a plasma. If we put to one side the electric and magnetic fields, the plasma is a region with a huge number of charged particles all in violent motion. Huge means more than millions, or even millions of millions but many orders of magnitude more than that. So many particles that the region is no longer microscopic in size, but is well within our senses. For groups of particles that are this big, we have a standard way to describe their atomic motion. It's called temperature. The faster the average speed of the particles, the higher the temperature. And in a plasma, things get very hot. The linear motion of the atoms, ions, and electrons is not the only contributor to the heat in the plasma. Remember that air also contains molecules which consist of more than one atom. What happens, for example, if one of the moving particles hits an oxygen molecule? An oxygen molecule consists of two oxygen atoms bound to each other through a mutual sharing of electrons in their outermost orbits. A collision can cause the oxygen molecule to rotate or to rotate more quickly, or it can cause the two component atoms to vibrate more vigorously with respect to each other. If the molecule has three atoms, like carbon dioxide does, then there are even more types of vibration possible. Each of these modes of rotation and vibration represents more kinetic energy, all of which contribute to higher temperatures and more heat. What happens when an ion finally makes its way across the gap and comes into contact with the negatively charged electrode? The nearest free electron will attach to the ion. The result will be a complete and electrically neutral atom once again. It's able to float away from the surface of the electrode. Of course, it will be subject to the conditions of the plasma and could be ionized a second time. Now, what happens when an electron finally makes its way across the gap and comes into contact with the positively charged electrode. In the big picture, an electron has moved from the negatively charged electrode to the positively charged electrode. The move didn't happen all at once. 
there might have been many steps along the way, and the electron which finally arrived at the positively charged electrode will not be the same one which left the negatively charged electrode. Overall, though, one negative charge has moved across the gap from the left side to the right side. We call the movement of charge a current. We define the direction of a current as the direction in which positive charges move. So the movement of an electron from left to right represents a current flowing from right to left. Now, the electric field, which started the whole ionization event, also drops from right to left. One could therefore define the electrical resistance of the gap as the voltage drop divided by the current, just like Ohm's law. In fact, what goes on inside a normal resistor is very similar to what goes on inside the plasma. Inside a normal resistor, the voltage drop causes electrons to move, and they bump into the atoms of the material. This bumping creates heat. Indeed, that's the whole purpose in life for a normal resistor, to convert electrical energy into kinetic energy and then into heat energy. If the surfaces of the metal electrodes at the ends of the gap are perfectly round and smooth, then the electrons will be distributed pretty uniformly across the surface. But even a polished metal sphere has microscopic imperfections. Or, like the electrodes in my spark gap, sharp points may have been introduced on purpose. The sharp points will change the distribution of the electrons. Under the attractive influence of the electric field, they will tend to move up into the point so that they can get closer to the positive electrode on the other side of the gap. The relocation of the electrons will change the electric field. In any region where electrons are concentrated or irregularly distributed, the strength and direction of the electric field will change. These changes in the electric field will further disrupt the locations of the other free electrons. It's not unusual for an electron to jump away from the metal for a moment. Whatever trajectory it takes, it will emit radiation as it accelerates and decelerates. If there are enough electrons milling around near a sharp point, some of the radiation will be in the frequencies of visible light. We call this radiation around a sharp point a corona discharge. The existence of more electrons near a sharp point and their excited behavior there makes it likely that the first ionization of atoms in the gap will occur somewhere around here. That will cause the spark chain reaction to start at a lower voltage drop across the gap than it would if the surfaces were perfectly smooth. The air in a spark gap is a mixture of various molecules. These are the four which are most abundant. Nitrogen and oxygen molecules contain two atoms each, and they constitute about 78% and 21% of air, respectively. Together, they make up 99% of air. Most of the remaining 1% consists of argon. It's one of the so-called noble gases, so it doesn't combine with other atoms, not even itself. It floats around as single atoms, and they make up about 0.9% of air. That leaves 0.1% unaccounted for. It's comprised of a number of different gases, of which the biggest component is carbon dioxide, at 0.04%. I'll ignore the other trace gases. This standard mixture of air is called dry air. But dry air misses the most interesting molecule of all, water vapor. Water in the air is what we call humidity. It gives rise to everything that we call weather. If it wasn't for water vapor, the Earth would have a very boring atmosphere. And it's an important component of real air. Depending on the local temperature and pressure, water vapor adds another 2 to 4 percent of air. That means there are 50 to 100 times more water molecules in a given volume of air than there are, say, carbon dioxide molecules. Scientists often study dry air. Even though that's not realistic, the problem they face is that the amount of water vapor is so variable that it messes up their results. Let's look at the breakdown voltages. It's said that dry air will break down at approximately 3,000 volts per millimeter. That's equivalent to 76,000 volts per inch. Studies show that the breakdown voltage of pure nitrogen gas is 15% higher than the breakdown voltage of dry air. 
the breakdown voltage of pure oxygen gas is 85% of the breakdown voltage of dry air. I'm not quite sure how to reconcile these figures. Since the breakdown voltage of oxygen is less, one might expect that all of the oxygen would be ionized before any of the nitrogen started to ionize. That would mean that the current across the spark gap would be sustained by ionized oxygen molecules and that the nitrogen molecules would remain neutrally charged and thus they would not participate in the spark. Apparently that's not the case. The alternative is that there is so much confusion during the chain reaction that nitrogen and oxygen both participate, likely in proportion to their abundance and their proclivity to ionize. But look at argon. The breakdown voltage of pure argon gas is only 20% of the breakdown voltage of dry air. Wow! With such a low breakdown voltage, one might expect the presence of argon to be extremely important to the formation of a spark. Perhaps it is, but its influence on the spark is limited because it's relatively scarce in air. Carbon dioxide comes in at 95% of the breakdown voltage of dry air, so it doesn't have much effect either way. So what is the effect of water vapor? I can't find any data on the breakdown voltage of water vapor as a gas. But studies do show that the presence of water vapor increases the breakdown voltage. On the surface of the Earth, air acts like an ideal gas. That means that the temperature and pressure determine the number of molecules in any given volume of air. The higher the humidity, the more molecules of water are present. They displace molecules of other gases which have a lower breakdown voltage, leaving the resulting humid air with a slightly higher overall breakdown voltage. Humidity will increase the breakdown voltage of real air by a few percentage points. My apparatus produces a stream of sparks in quick succession. So the question arises, what does air look like after a spark, but before a second spark? One issue is that the spark chain reaction generates new types of molecules. As the simplest example of ionization, the electric field ionizes an oxygen molecule, producing an oxygen ion and a free electron. When the ion reaches the negative electrode, it regains an electron, producing a neutral oxygen molecule identical to the one at the outset. In reality, though, there are lots of chemical reactions which are not simple ionizations and whose reaction products are not the same as the reactants. Atoms get rearranged to produce new types of gases of which the most common are nitric acid, ozone, and carbon monoxide. The molecules in the original gas are physically moved during the spark. Consider, for an example, an argon atom somewhere in the gap. Initially, it's electrically neutral, so it's not affected by the electric field. If, by chance, an electron gets bumped off, the electric field will accelerate the positively charged argon ion to the left. It's possible that the ion won't travel all the way to the electrode, but might regain an electron at some point. But if it's ionized a second time, the ion will be accelerated to the left a little bit more. At the end of the spark chain reaction, the argon atom will be electrically neutral again, but it will be located somewhere to the left of its original position. A third issue that affects repeatability is the fact that the spark rarefies the air. Let me explain what that means. When the spark starts to form, the region of space it's in will heat up. It will heat up a lot. This will cause the air in the region to expand. As the spark develops fully, the region will get even hotter and expand even more. Everywhere along the edge of the expanding region, there will be a sudden rise in temperature and pressure. Because the spark occurs very quickly, the expansion of the region is explosive, and this boundary where there's a discontinuity in temperature and pressure will move radially outwards from the spark at very great speed. The discontinuity is called a shock wave or sonic boom. When the shock wave reaches our ears, we hear it as a snap. Although it's high pressure inside the region which causes the expansion, the molecules are physically blown apart from each other. After the expansion is complete, the central region will contain fewer molecules than it did before the spark. We say that the air has been rarefied. 
there will be fewer molecules available to be ionized if a second spark wants to form. Accumulation of residue on the electrodes is another problem. One of the many different kinds of chemical reactions which occurs in the plasma is this one. A molecule of carbon dioxide and two molecules of oxygen can be broken up and recombined to leave an atom of carbon and two ozone molecules. If the carbon atom is ionized, it will be driven towards the negative electrode. It may very well attach itself to the electrode. The soot which accumulates on electrodes is made up of carbon atoms like this one. Another source of residue comes from particles of dust or other contaminants in the air. An electron moving around in the plasma can become attached to such particle. Now that it's negatively charged, the electric field will accelerate the whole dust particle towards the positive electrode. It might very well stick there. All of these factors make it more difficult for another spark to form. They tend to increase the voltage needed to cause a second breakdown. The only offsetting factor is that the heat generated will cause all of the molecules in the region to rise, including those newly formed molecules which are not good for ionization. The updraft will tend to suck in fresh air from below. Let's start to put together a circuit to simulate the operation of the spark gap. LT Spice is a good simulator and it's free. The basic circuit consists of the 2 megohm resistance and the 8800 picofarad capacitance wired in series across the 6000 volt DC voltage source. The spark gap, when it's in the plasma state and current is flowing through, is represented by a 100 ohm resistor. S1 is a voltage controlled switch. When it's closed, the capacitor will discharge through the 100 ohm gap resistor. When the switch is open, no current will flow through the spark gap. The characteristics of the switch must be defined with a line in the header called a model line. I've defined the switch so that it's almost perfect. Its series resistance when it's closed is 1 micro ohm, which is virtually nothing. When the switch is open, its resistance is 100 megohms, which is enormous. The threshold voltage VT and the hysteresis voltage VH determine when the switch will open and close. These control voltages are applied to the terminals on the side of the switch. The combination of 0.5 volts for V threshold and 0 volts for V hysteresis mean that the switch will be closed when the side circuit's voltage is above 0.5 volts and the switch will be open when the side circuit's voltage is less than 0.5 volts. There won't be any overlap between the voltages at which the switch opens and closes. The side circuit which controls the gap switch is this voltage source. LT Spice calls this an arbitrary behavioral voltage source. It's introduced into the schematic by selecting BV, that's Bravo Victor, from the list of available components that opens up under the Edit tab. The behavior is defined in an equation. Here, I've used a simple if-then formula. If the voltage drop over the capacitor is greater than the breakdown voltage, then 1 volt will be applied to the gap switch, and it will close. If the voltage drop over the capacitor is less than the breakdown voltage, then 0 volts will be applied to the gap switch, and it will open. Note that I can use the variable V breakdown in this formula because I defined it as a parameter up in the header. The only other thing to note is this initial condition in the header. The voltage drop over the capacitor is set to zero at the start of simulation time. I will not show any results for this circuit because it doesn't work. It doesn't work for two completely separate reasons. The first reason is a technicality relating to the simulation process. Although LT Spice and other simulators like it run on digital computers, they treat a circuit like this one as an analog circuit in which the voltages and currents change a little bit from one instant in the simulation time to the next instant a very short time later. Simulators get flustered if something changes too quickly. Here, the gap switch opens and closes virtually instantaneously. LT Spice can't handle that. It goes into defense condition mode and, for all intents and purposes, stops. The other reason this circuit fails is a logical error. The switch closes as soon as the capacitor is charged up to 3,300 volts. That's good. We want that. However, as soon as the switch closes, current will start to rush through the 100 ohm gap resistance. 
In short order, the voltage drop over the capacitor will decrease. It will decrease below 3300 volts almost immediately and cause the switch to reopen. We need a way to keep the switch closed. Here's one way to do it. I've brought in a D-type flip-flop. It's another one of the standard components in the LT-SPICE default library. It runs with a logic high voltage of 1 volt. That's perfect here because I defined the gap switch to flip at 1 half volt. The flip-flop's clock input is the same arbitrary behavioral voltage source as before. When the voltage drop over the capacitor rises above the breakdown voltage, the voltage from this source will change from 0 to 1 volt. This rising edge is the trigger for the flip-flop to transfer the voltage at its D input to its Q output. The voltage at the D input is simple. It's a constant 1 volt. When the clock triggers the flip-flop, the voltage at the Q output goes high and then stays high. That's exactly what we need. We could send this signal straight over to the controlling terminals of the gap switch. The gap switch would close and stay closed. Unfortunately, this instantaneous rise of the voltage at the Q output is still too fast for LT SPICE. The simulation will grind to a halt. The transition at the Q output needs to be slowed down. I use an RC circuit for this purpose. When the Q voltage goes high, current will flow through the 1 ohm resistor and charge up the 10 picofarad capacitor. The gap switch will close only when the voltage drop over the capacitor climbs up to 1 half volt. This charging process is actually very fast. The time constant for charging the capacitor is the resistance multiplied by the capacitance, and that's only 10 picoseconds. That very short delay is just what LT SPICE needs to get through the transition. I've named the node at the top of the capacitor. I've called it control, since it's this voltage over the capacitor that actually controls the state of the gap switch. Lastly, I've added an initial condition in the header to ensure that the control voltage starts off in the simulation at zero volts. This plot shows the voltage drop over the capacitor produced by the simulation. When the voltage reaches 3,300 volts, the gap switch closes and the capacitor discharges. Here, I've magnified the time axis to show the detail of the discharge. The spark lasts for about 3 microseconds. The main capacitor is 8800 picofarads. It's charged up by the 2 megohm resistor with a time constant of 17.6 milliseconds. During the spark, the main capacitor discharges through the 100 ohm resistor. The time constant for the discharge is 0.88 microseconds. Just so there's no confusion, the 10 picosecond time constant I described a few moments ago applies right here. The RC circuit with the 10 picosecond time constant has nothing to do with the spark itself and is simply a technique to help the simulator work its way through this sharp point. All is well and good, except for one thing. There's only one spark. My goal is to have a stream of pulses. This schematic shows the modifications I made to simulate a stream of pulses. Before getting into the details, I had to make an important decision. What causes the spark to stop? The spark starts when the air breaks down. I tested the voltage drop over the gap as the condition for starting the spark, as is usual. The spark will stop when the source of power can no longer supply enough current to keep the plasma alive. I decided to use a current threshold to stop the spark. In the schematic shown, the spark will stop as soon as the current flowing across the gap falls below 100 milliamps, or 0.1 amperes. This cutoff current is defined as a parameter in the header. Only two new components were needed to implement this current test. V3 is a constant voltage source, set to 0 volts. It therefore has no effect at all on the voltages and currents in the circuit. So, why use it? I use it as an ammeter, just a way to measure the current flowing across the spark gap. The current flowing through the gap is used in the decision making of this arbitrary behavioral voltage source. Its operation is described by another if-then statement. When the result is true, the voltage at this source will go from 0 to 1 volt. This voltage is applied to the clear input pin of the flip-flop. A high logic voltage at the clear input will cause the Q output to go low. 
The 10 picofarad control capacitor will then discharge through the 1 ohm control resistor and the gap switch will turn off, which is to say it will open. Let's look at the if-then formula that generates the trigger for the clear pin. The test condition has two parts, which I've highlighted in blue. Each part is an inequality. The two parts are joined together by a logical AND. Both inequalities have to be true for the clear signal to appear. The inequality on the right is the obvious one. The current flowing through the voltage source V3 has to be less than the defined cutoff voltage. The inequality on the left isn't quite so obvious. The DDT function is defined in LT SPICE as the change in something divided by the change in time. Here it's the change in the gap current divided by the change in time. This ratio must be less than zero. It must be negative. This inequality is the mathematical way of saying that the current must be decreasing. The current at every step in the simulation has to be less than the current at the previous step. This test is needed to prevent clear signals from being generated when the current is increasing, as it will be when the spark is just starting to form. This plot shows the voltage drop over the capacitor produced by the simulation. The red waveform is the current flowing through the gap. When the spark starts, the current is about 33 amperes. The current falls to zero in about 5 microseconds. Of course, the current doesn't fall all the way to zero. When the current reaches 100 milliamps, the gap switch opens and the main capacitor begins to charge up for the next spark. I want to add one more characteristic to the stream of sparks. I want to model the increase in the breakdown voltage as the succession of sparks changes the state of the air in the gap. To do this, I've added another arbitrary behavioral source, which I've named B growth. At every time step in the simulation, B growth calculates a new breakdown voltage. The behavioral source, which closes the gap switch, now uses this calculated breakdown voltage to determine when it should trigger. Previously, it used a fixed voltage which was defined as a parameter. I've chosen to model the breakdown voltage as a starting value, which thereafter increases at a fixed rate as time increases. I've called the starting voltage VBD0, and it's defined as a parameter. I've assumed that the breakdown voltage increases by 25% every second. I've defined this growth rate as another parameter. In the formula for the breakdown voltage, it's multiplied by the simulation time. LT SPICE has a ramp function, U ramp. When used with the argument time, it returns the simulation time elapsed since the start of the simulation. This plot shows the voltage drop over the capacitor produced by the simulation with an increasing breakdown voltage. The plot covers a time period of 3.2 seconds. Note that sparking stops after about 3 seconds. At the start of the simulation, the breakdown voltage is 3.3 kilovolts. The last spark in the simulation took place when the breakdown voltage was just under 6 kilovolts. The higher the breakdown voltage gets, the longer the time between sparks. It takes longer for the capacitor to charge up. At 3.3 kilovolts, sparks are 14.4 milliseconds apart. By the end of the simulation, they're 71.6 milliseconds apart. This is the oscilloscope with the spark gap in operation. I've set the time axis so that each horizontal division represents 10 milliseconds. The vertical axis is set to 5 volts per division. But that isn't too important because the spark overwhelms the scope's input circuit and merely shows up as a spike. The scope can't seem to lock on to the spikes, so the display is continually changing. That's a sign that the length of time between the spikes is not constant. In order to extract any information about the timing, I found it necessary to examine individual frames of the video I made of the display. This is one frame from the video. Video runs pretty slowly. The video camera records the display 24 times per second, or once every 42 milliseconds. That means that the scope's trace moves horizontally about four divisions during every video frame. Here, I've overlaid the next frame in the video. The display now records four sparks. The time between the first two sparks is 17.2 milliseconds. 
the third spark occurs 19.2 milliseconds after the second spark, and the fourth one occurs 22.8 milliseconds later. Much as I like my little antenna, I discovered a better way to examine the sparks, the audio recording. This is an audio recording of the sparks viewed with the program Audacity. This audio clip is one half second long. Here's what it sounds like. The clip is only one half second long, so I'll play it twice more. The audio waveform is particularly convenient because it's accompanied by a time scale. The clip runs from 0 through to 0 0.5 seconds. 20 sparks occurred during this one half second. The feature in this plot that we can rely on is the shock wave. When the shock wave hits the microphone, the discontinuity and pressure drives the diaphragm to its physical limit and causes an instantaneous rise in the amplitude of the signal. On the other hand, we cannot rely on the decay of the signal after the shock wave. The waveform shown is not related to the discharge of the capacitor in the apparatus. Instead, the oscillations in the microphone and the audio firmware as they try to recover from the shock dominate everything else. It's an easy matter to measure the length of time between sparks. For example, it's 38 milliseconds between the third and fourth sparks. This plot shows the length of time between successive sparks. Since there are 20 sparks, there are 19 interspark durations. They seem to hover around 20 milliseconds, with an occasional excursion up to 55 milliseconds. I want to make a short digression into mathematics. Bear with me. This red trace is the voltage drop over the main capacitor as it charges up. As I've said before, the rate of charging is governed by the time constant, the resistance multiplied by the capacitance. In the apparatus, time constant is 17.6 milliseconds. There's a mathematical expression for this curve. The voltage drop over the capacitor at any instant in time is equal to 6,000 volts multiplied by a factor which is 1 minus an exponential term. The exponential term is the number e raised to the negative power of the time t divided by the time constant, where t is the time since charging started. e is just a number. It's equal to 2.7183. We saw in the last slide that the apparatus makes sparks which repeat after about 20 milliseconds. The voltage drop over the capacitor after 20 milliseconds of charging is calculated by substituting 20 milliseconds, or 0.02 seconds, for the time t in the formula. The result is 4,075 volts. The sparks in the apparatus usually trigger when the voltage over the capacitor reaches 4,075 volts. We can go one step further. We can calculate the width of the spark gap in the apparatus. Since the breakdown voltage of air is about 3,000 volts per millimeter, the observed breakdown voltage of 4,075 volts divided by 3,000 will give the gap width. It's 1.4 millimeters. I've confirmed this width using a micrometer. I've now returned to the audio clip with the plot showing time between sparks. If we convert the time between sparks to the breakdown voltage using the formula, we get this graph showing the breakdown voltage for successive sparks. The breakdown voltage hovers around 4,000 volts, with the occasional excursion up to almost 6,000 volts. One thing that's clear is that the breakdown voltage does not increase uniformly with time until sparking stops. On the other hand, there are some trend lines. The breakdown voltage can decrease spark after spark for five or six sparks in a row, or it can increase during three or four successive sparks. Well, that's enough about sparks for today. Thanks for watching. See you next time.